So as we get ready to pray, just hum in your heart, if you can't sing, a wonderful change has come over me. Oh God, change is hard for all of us. but you demand nothing at less. And so, Lord, in all of us who are here in this room, Lord, you know everything about our lives and our journey. You know where we're stuck. You know where we're resistant. You know where we're disobedient. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, open our lives so we can hear your word. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a couple of requests of you in during the Sermon on the Mount series, we are trying to make it a participatory series. And so rather than just me talking, you will need your Bibles. You will need to use the outline that you have before you. And you may even have a chance to read or to answer a question or two. Can you say, I will be engaged? And engage means I will participate. The Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew's Gospel towards the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The setting for the Sermon on the Mount is found in chapter 4, verse 17. Can somebody find Matthew 4 and 17 and read it for me. Matthew 4, 17. All right. Jesus is beginning his ministry, and the ministry begins with this word called repentance. Can anybody tell me what repentance means? To turn away. All right, that's a good start. What are the other definitions of, of repentance? To change your mind. So to turn away or to change your mind. If there is nothing else you get out of today's teaching is that when Jesus invites us to come to journey with him, he expects us to be different. Can you say different? And to be different requires a change in heart and mind and attitude so that we become the women and men that God intends us to be. One of the key texts in the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 6 and verse 8. Can somebody else find Matthew 6 and 8 and read it for us? Jesus says, do not be like them. He is trying to paint a picture that those who follow him are different from the people in the world. That there is a distinction when you are a child of God from not being a child of God. There is a difference being one of God's chosen from not being one of God's chosen. He says in the Sermon on the Mount that, that something radically different must happen in my life and in your life. 
Let's read together the next paragraph. It says, the Sermon on the Mount, let's read together. The Sermon on the Mount is a description of the Christian culture. It describes its value systems, ethical standards, religious devotion, attitude to money, ambition, lifestyle, and network of relationship. Jesus, when he taught this, did this teaching, was teaching primarily to this huge Jewish audience who thought we know everything about God. Have you ever gotten to a point in your life where you think you know everything about God? You've read the scriptures, you know it all, and so here he comes. And he says, you are a holy people. What does holy mean? Chloe, set apart. You have my outline. That's the first one on my outline here. You got it, Chloe. What's the second one? Sacred. All right. Consecrated or sacred. And what's the third? Sanctified. So God's people are set apart different people. Jesus is teaching this sermon on a mountain. It really, really wasn't a high mountain. It was more like a hill. It wasn't a, one of those peaks like even Mount Sinai or Kilimanjaro or the Blue Mountains or give me a peak on the West Coast. Your geography. Not, not Tahoe, not Great Bear. This was a little hilltop. But the significance of the hilltop was that it put him in light with another great teacher who went up to a mountain to receive instruction from God. Who was that? Moses. Yet it's not identical to what Moses did. So we're going to look at the Jesus way of teaching. We're on the outline where it says, what are the essential features and characteristics of a Christian? There is a word that's used to describe people who display these characteristics. What's the word used in Matthew? Blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? If you were listening to Dwayne, you heard him. Favored, happy, what else? Satisfied or content. So Jesus was saying that if you display these things, you will have the best life ever. You will have the happiest and most fulfilled life. Now, whenever I see that, it makes me get intrigued. I'm thinking, I want the best life. I want a happy life. I want a blessed life. And so as we enter into looking at these eight characteristics that Jesus points out, there are some principles that we should have in mind. Let's read A to D, the general principles. All Christians. So you can't say, I like poor in spirit, but I don't want to be merciful. Or I like hungering and thirsting, but I don't want the persecution piece. It's a whole package. And every single one of us in this room gets the chance to experience the full life. So God invites us to look on them with the recognition that they are not natural. When you look on 
the eight so-called Beatitudes. And somebody may ask, where did we get Beatitudes from? Well, in the Latin, Beatitude refers to happiness. And so, literally, we're using the Latin translation because for a good part of the history of the Bible, it was written in Latin. They took it from Greek and Hebrew, putting in Latin, and it was in Latin for a long while. You would come to church. It would be read in Latin. You couldn't understand if you didn't speak Latin, but it was read in Latin. And then it got moved to English and other languages. The Beatitudes or the characteristics of a Christian have a certain pattern to them. There is firstly a condition and secondly there is a result of that condition. So let's look on the first one. What's the condition? Blessed are the poor in spirit. What's the result of being poor in spirit? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit means acknowledging our complete bankruptcy before God. It means as a person being able in the presence of God to be able to say, God, I have thoughts, I have views, I have prejudices, I have issues which are standing in the way of me connecting with you. So God, empty me so that I'm ready to find you. How many of us find it really hard to empty ourselves to learn anything new? I found that the longer I am on the journey and the more I know about Scripture and the more I participate is the more I think I'm all right. And God says, unless you have that poverty of spirit, your relationship with God suffers. So let me ask, why is it difficult for us to admit our spiritual poverty? Somebody may look at you and they say, I can't imagine you've been coming to church and you don't know God. Look on the next one. Blessed are they that mourn. Let's translate it even further with the word that we know. Happy are the unhappy. Does that make sense? That's a tough one. Life tells us that we should shun our mourning. Life says, turn away from anything that causes you sadness, grief. And yet, the Christian mourns their loss of innocence. The Christian mourns the loss of righteousness. The Christian mourns the loss of self-respect. The Christian says to God, God, I'm not who and what I want to be, and I feel bad about it. What are some of the things that have happened lately in the world which have caused you to mourn? The burning of the churches causes you to mourn. Something else that causes you to mourn. ISIS causes you to mourn. I mean, some of the things that happen that they do are unbelievable. What else causes you to mourn? The killing of the nine people at the Amy Church in Charleston. Richard? 
Police killings cause you to mourn. Uche? The killing of the Afghanistan woman who was trying to teach the right thing. Jeffries? Negativity towards the president that you see in the media. When you and I get to a stage in our lives where we realize it's not right, sometimes in your spirit you grieve and you groan and through your groaning it leads you where? It leads you to God. Blessed are they that mourn. What's the, re the result of those who mourn? For they shall be comforted. Look on the next one. The next one is a hard one for our world. Blessed are they. Who, who, who is a meek person? A humble person. Now, does meek mean that you just lay over and let somebody run up and down you, over you, that you don't stand for anything, that you have no spine, no backbone? So what does it mean to be humble? Can I ask somebody, what does it mean to be humble? I think... You know who you are, that you're def defined by God, and because of God's goodness and God's grace, you realize each and every day, were it not for God, where or who would I be? And so your attitude to others is determined by having a true estimate of how God sees you. Most of us have times in a journey when we're not humble. Right? And our world applauds you if you're not humble. I mean, I, I can only think about our fellow member who was confirmed here. And the longer it goes is the more you say things which don't make sense because you have to prove that I'm here. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, says the scripture. And God will raise you up. Look on the fourth characteristics. Blessed are those who most Americans don't know what it means to be hungry. That's a fact. There are People around the world who what we eat in one meal, that's a week or two weeks supply of food. Have you ever seen your trash? I lost something yesterday, and so I was in the trash. Have you ever gone into Fourth of July trash? <laughs> there is more stuff. And it occurred to me, I am very full. Hunger and thirst is hard to define in, 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 in our context because we have had so much abundance. But those who have this desire, this desire that they cannot survive without food and water, those who have that kind of desire in your relationship with God, 
meet God and find God. Can I ask you this morning, how hungry are you for God? How hungry are you to get to know God and to get to know God's righteousness? And biblical righteousness means not just right conduct, but it means right thinking. Right thinking leads to right conduct, and it comes in the form of three elements, three aspects. There's a legal aspect that is getting us into a right relationship with God. We get into a right relationship with God by a term that the old reformer of the Christian church used, Martin Luther. Anybody knows Martin Luther's term? Brandon, you can show, show us all, right? Justification by faith. That you don't get right with God unless God makes you right. We have this table down here. This table is a holy table. This table is symbolic of Jesus Christ dying on Calvary. Nobody deserves to come to this table. None of us can make ourselves right and clean enough to come to this table. We come to this table because who makes us right? Jesus makes us right. And so when we talk about justification by faith, it is through trusting in God that I come into a right relationship with God. But here is the piece that sometimes we forget. And sometimes it happens in a church like the Presbyterian church. We say, God makes me right. But if you are made right by God, you also have to connect with the other piece of righteousness. That God expects me and you in your character and conduct to walk in a way which pleases God. That's hard, right? Have you ever gone through your daily checklist and said, God, were you happy with this? Were you pleased with this? Were you pleased with what I said? How I conducted myself? What I did? What I shared? How I responded to people around me? There are expectations because righteousness is about doing the right thing. Thirdly, biblical righteousness has a social component. That what's wrong in the world, God's people don't say, let it just continue. You work to change what's wrong in the world. Civil rights, justice, and fairness. And that you can't ever say as a child of God, it's not my business. If you are here in the world, if you are here in a neighborhood, if you are in a country, if you are in a city, God expects all of us to work for what's right. So we have covered the first four. And the first four, poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness have something in common. What do they have in common? They all connect us with our attitude or our need for God. When you look on the first four, they're all opening up in your heart a path to get closer to God. Look on the next four. The next four have a lot to do with our disposition or how we act in relation to other human beings. So blessed are the merciful. 
for they shall receive mercy. My question to you is, how does your treatment of others affect God's treatment of you? Should God just look on me and say, I want mercy? And Jesus has all these teachings about people who want God to help them. But each and every day, we impact other people in ways that are not godlike. The next one, blessed are the pure in heart. What's the result if you're pure in heart? You shall see God. Anybody know the two people in the Old Testament who saw God? Moses and Enoch, right? Two people who went to be with God. Now, I could be incorrect because Isaiah saw the hem of his garment. Didn't really see God's face, but he saw the hem of his garment, and something radical happened to him. Seeing God for the people of God in the Old Testament was the biggest thing that could ever happen. Blessed are the pure in heart. What does being pure in heart mean? It means having a single eye. What does it mean to have a single eye? It means having clarity and purpose about how you and I live our lives. It means having the central devotion that comes out in the words of the hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. What is the promise for the pure in heart? They shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. What does a peacemaker do? They're involved in the work of reconciliation, building bridges, bringing people together. The media had a hard time when the members of this church in Charleston, instead of saying, I want justice and I want you to kill the person, when people who were there in the midst of the prayer meeting come out saying, forgive them. Peacemaking and bridge building and reconciliation is the heart of the call to ministry. And I want to ask you as I'm asking myself, am I building bridges? Am I helping to unite the church so the church can do the work that God has called it to do? Or am I always stirring something so that this church can never, ever be united? Am I stirring the family so the family can never come together on the same page? Am I at work functioning in such a way that the job can never be done because we spend more time putting out fires than being able to do what God has called us to do? Verse, verses 10 to 12 the eighth characteristic. Can we read it together? What does Jesus say there? What's persecution? Persecution involves hostility. Persecution 
involves tension. Persecution involves being accused wrongly. Jesus says it's a good thing. If, you're, if everybody thinks you're okay and you're the best person in the world and, and they like you, something is wrong. It means you are not different. So when you look on these eight characteristics of a blessed or happy person, are you living the blessed life? Are you living the happy life? And if you're not living, then Jesus invites you, and he invites me to begin walking in his Christian way. And he says, you not only have to have the character, but you have to apply it. Let's read in bold on the last page that paragraph, which says, It is me they meet. It is you. And the question is, are you different? Well, Jesus uses two metaphors to talk about different. Salt and light. Does anybody remember when pork used to come in those barrels? all filled with brine and big grains of salt. Would never spoil as long as it had salt. Tracy said this morning that salt is a preservative. It preserves things around it. And if you are salt, you are helping to preserve the world. But anybody who cooks, have you ever cooked without salt? No, they am not going to the extreme. But when you get food that doesn't have any salt in it, it takes some doing to eat it. Salt adds flavor. And can you imagine Jesus is saying the Christian brings flavor and preservative to the world? Well, what does light bring? Clarification, Removes darkness, it brings illumination, leads people into truth, opens up a path for them, helps them to discover what's on the other side of the room. Jesus says, you are salt and light. So we're closing down. God, let's read together. God expects some things of us. Firstly, be different. Secondly, salt and light, the great thing about them is that if salt is there and light is there, you know. Can't miss the light, can't miss the salt. Thirdly, be an influencer. Give and expand what God has blessed you with. If you have a those eight characteristics go out and influence. When we do, when we are different, when we represent, when we are influencer, something marvelous happens. What do you think, eh? What do you think happens when we are different, when we represent, and when we influence? Kiara? You're blessed. You're happy. Something starts to happen in your life. And then what happens to the world? 
The world is better served because you are better. And look on verse 16 of Matthew 5. Let's read that together. Verse 16 of Matthew 5. Can we read verse 16 of Matthew 5 together? When we are different and let our light shine, God gets the glory. Over the next number of weeks, we'll explore what it means to be different. Amen.